Morning guys, Dr. Ken Nordberg again, like I always say, <laughs> on a, a rainy Friday morning. Boy, have we gotten rain the last couple of days. Uh, because of the drought, my bedraggled garden went from rags to soaked rags in the last two days. <laughs> it's, what a miserable time here in Minnesota because of the weather, so strange. But, and it's affecting our our deer. And it's affecting our northern forests. We've had some serious wildfires going on in northern Minnesota. Oh, not that many miles from my whitetail study hunting area. And I hope it doesn't get there. But the way fires are going nowadays, that kind of thing can happen. Last time we talked about uh, the importance of avoiding sounds that enable whitetails to identify you, the hunter. And I mentioned the fact that hearing is a whitetail's most important way of locating and identifying and avoiding hunters on the ground or in a tree. But there's so much hunters do that don't account for that. We can walk into the wind or crosswind to get stand sight and sit in a stand sight downwind or crosswind. The white tails can't smell you except when they're directly downwind of you. Uh, so that limits what they can do with their nose to avoid you. In heavy timber like where we hunt, you can walk all over the place in that woods and white tails might catch little glimpses of you over there and over there, but if they can't positively sure what you are, they're going to run away. They're going to stay there and they'll try to figure out what you are before they decide what to do. So they're kind of limited on what they see in the woods as well. Now with hearing, their hearing is protecting them in a complete circle around them 24-7. And hearing does more to enable them to locate and uh, identify and avoid you than anything else. Uh, any other sense that a whitetail has. And for that reason, to be a successful hunter, especially a successful buck hunter, you have to do things to reduce the chances of being heard by those deer. Especially while you're going to your buck effective stand site where your odds of seeing a big buck are pretty good. Uh, you, you don't want anything to happen along that way or make sounds along that way that are going to tell me here comes a human or there's a human right over there and I'm going to stay away from there. So that's kind of important and we discussed a couple ways of doing that. And like uh, when you're walking to your stand, if you walk softly, pick up your feet with each step, clearing the ground of all the clutter that's on the ground and then putting your feet down lightly with each step. And if you do that without breaking a lot of twigs and branches in the process, it's going to be very difficult for a whitetail way over there somewhere or over there to know just exactly what kind of a creature is making those footsteps they occasionally hear. But the better you are at, at walking softly, the more deer you're going to see at your stand sites. So that's kind of important. And another way, there's still another way, and this is the one that Wolves taught us, there's another way to get close without goofing things up. And that's to use the, the wolf roast, I explained. Uh, walking along and acting as if you have no interest at all in, in deer. You're just walking straight through, looking straight ahead, non-stop, not looking at tracks or stopping to look around and listen. You just go straight to your stand site. Most deer along the way, they even they might hear you coming and then when they hear it, when they can hear you coming, they'll they'll move to the side, maybe stand and cover where they're difficult to be seen. They'll just watch you go by. As long as you keep moving that way, and you're going to appear to be harmless. And so by doing that you can get to stand sites without alarming all the deer on the way, and believe me, there's always deer along. You don't go to a stand site almost anywhere if you go more than a few blocks. There's going to be deer close enough to hear you and see you and smell you on the way there. I mean, if you're in an area where there's 
20, 30 deer per square mile. Well, that's a lot of deer out there. And there's no way you can go any great distance in that square mile without passing a lot of deer. You may not realize, you might think, oh, geez, there's not a deer in the world in this area. But that's not generally true. It just won't be true until some people make it a drive or some guy wandering around there for a couple days chases them all out of there. But at, at least initially, there's a lot of deer all around you. Or the whole time you're hunting there, if it's just stand hunters hunting in the area where you hunt, if they're all stand hunters, all those deer are going to stay there the whole time you're there. But if you don't alarm any of them on the way there, your odds of seeing some of those deer that were, that were watching you and listening you or smelling you going by will end up close to your stand site. And if it's a big buck, of course, you know, your odds of getting that big buck are much better. So those are things we talked about last time, but keep, can't never forget that, that kind of a lesson. That's so important to buck hunting. The task of making it really hard for the buck you'd like to Let's say, oh, you got a stand out here and these big bucks have a lot of tracks out there and they've been feeding out in this field here and, and uh, uh, fresh dropped in tracks all over and, and here on the edge of that or on a trail leading into, the, into that feeding area and, and you're saying to yourself, boy, my odds of taking that big buck that made those four inch tracks here are very good. And you're sort of pretty excited about it. And let's say you got to go a long way. Now, my boys and I this year will be traveling almost daily more than a mile one way to get to a stand site, most of us. Twice daily. And some of us will be going two miles. And a couple of them, us might be going even three miles to get to their stand sites. But we're going to be passing a lot of deer. Now, you don't want to alarm any of those deer on the way to the stand site. And here's why. Uh, this is important to know. Let's say you just started out, you know, you, you went down this log and road, now your trail going to the stand site goes all this way. Let's say it goes east quite a ways. And you get on there and you go about a block and there all of a sudden, kroom, kroom, you hear a deer bounding away and snorting, snort, snort, you know, holy, and you think, well, I'm still a long way from a stand site, that, so I don't have to worry about that. But you do, you do. Now, here's what happens, here's a square mile, and let's say there's 20 deer per square mile in there, and, and you alarm one deer, and it takes off running away from you. In other words, more than likely it's gonna run ahead of where you're going, it's going in that direction, see, and so you're going in and boom, there away it goes and it's going off ahead of you there. Now, all those deer that are living in there, a great number of them, are going to hear that deer bounding and snorting. Oh, and what does that mean to all those deer? Something dangerous is behind that deer, it's running from that area because something dangerous is there, you see. Well, let's say you, you, you made the mistake of taking your ATV to get to that trail and you drove that down there and it stopped. Or let's say you drove your pickup over there and stopped. And you got out in the morning, loaded your gun, you slammed the door and the tailgate and you're all set to go. Well, a smart deer, one that's been around for a number of years, three and a half years or longer, especially the bucks, and they hear that and say, they know they're, they're, here's a hunter, a hunter is coming. That's, those are preludes to hunting. Coming. And uh, so they are expecting, uh, they're going to say, is there one going to be coming up this way? And pretty soon they hear those footsteps. And if they're typically human, then you're dragging your heels and stepping on twigs, well, that's a human, all right. Now a big buck is liable to sneak away without making noise because they don't want to, they know it's bad to attract tension when a human is there. So they'll sneak away, but they're going off in that direction. But a younger deer, you know, like say a yearling, it takes off yearling doe and this longer buck running like crazy. And all these deer hear that and they are all told something is dangerous is coming. 
So they're be going to be on guard. They're going to be watching and listening and smelling and to find out if that dangerous thing is headed their way. And they're going to be really alert to that for up to a half hour all along the way. Now some of the deer that are close to where that deer is running are going to be frightened right away and they're going to join that deer and pretty soon they maybe have two, three, four deer running through the woods. And they just keep doing that all across that mile. Now, in that mile, there's maybe going to be three, four big bucks living in that mile. Except while breeding the progress, there might be only one big buck because the big guy chased all the other ones out temporarily while those are in heat. But anyway, there's normally three, four, five older bucks, of a lot of which a lot of hunters would be happy to put on the wall. It's a trophy class buck as far as they're concerned. Those, those three to five bucks, any one of them. But all of them, or most of them, have been alerted by this time, by that one deer being, a, being alarmed by you. And it, it's really possible because most big bucks will bed in the summer. They don't all bed together, you know, the bucks, they, they don't all bed together except during certain times in the fall, uh, when, when, you know, like in October, September and October, they might, some of them might bed together, and then a lot of them, when, after November, and when the bachelor groups start getting together after that first breeding period is over, but most time they, they, they bed alone, but they make it a point to use other deer like radar to avoid danger. And so a big buck will usually lay where he can see or hear or smell a doe family, at least one, maybe two, not far away. And if they start acting alarmed by something, uh, by running or snorting or releasing that ammonia-like odor, I call it danger scent, from the tarsal glands of their hind legs into there, and they smell that's all, there's something dangerous over there. That buck is, already knows about it. He knows there's something dangerous coming. So before long, most, if not all, the deer in that square mile know you're coming. And that's why, it, that's how it happens. And it's not something that just happens once in a while by luck. It happens every single time you make a deer raise his tail and bound away. And you don't know it because you're not seeing it happen, but it's happening. All of a sudden, there's tumult amongst the deer all through this square mile. And that's not good. You don't want that to be happening. And what that means is, especially when you're hunting older bucks, you don't want to alarm any deer while you're hunting. How about that? And that's a really, really big reason why you should always use the wolf roost I taught you in the last summer when going to and from stand size, when you're standing. Always use that. And that's why you should consider today, if you don't aren't a stand you should become a stand hunter because wandering around, randomly around your hunting area or making drives through it is going to do the damage in one or two days at the most. By the end of that time, there won't be hunting any deer on that square mile. But if you want to hunt bucks, and then it would be a good idea to hunt in a way so all those older bucks, those three to five that live there, stay there the whole time you're in the woods. And they will if you walk softly and use the wolf rose. Now, hunting in a way that doesn't alarm deer begins the minute, well, in our family, it begins the minute we step out of our tents. You know, we, we camp where we hunt. So, now, if you drive to your hunting spot every day uh, to hunt, you know, go there in the morning, you live where we're here, stay in a resort over here on this lake and you hunt over in this area, something like that, or in this farm area or something, every day and you drive there, you should start doing things in a way to keep deer from becoming alarmed where you hunt when you're at least a mile or more away from your hunting area. <laughs> and the reason I say that is because, think of this now. Let's say you and I are driving down a road together in a car, a rural road, 
and there's a farm field up ahead, and gee, so there's a bunch of deer out there. Oh, God, look at that big buck out there with those. So what are we going to do? Oh, we're going to get closer, and then we're going to stop so we can look at that buck a little bit better. It's pretty exciting to see one like that. And so what happens when you stop? They'll all run away, right? They run away. They hide. They go. They're gone. Some young deer that don't know better will, might stay there. And they're looking at you and they're really nervous about all this and finally their tail goes up and the white tail spreads and the white shows and they go too. Call a mama wherever she went. But that's what happens. And why do they do that? Because sometime in the past, uh, one or more people, maybe a, a desperate deer hunter who hardly ever gets a deer, uh, saw that buck or other deer there and, and, and stopped nearby and took a shot at him. Or some poacher came along at night and, oh, you know, the deer on the field and they took a shot at him or several shots at him. But they've been trained by people who tried to kill them <laughs> when, uh, in that field or wherever they were, in the ditch or whatever, when they stopped their vehicle. So in the old days, I remember, you could drive by deer all over the place. They were eating in ditches and mountain fields, and you could stop, and that wouldn't happen. I remember when I was young, and I know those people say, oh, there aren't near as many deer as there used to because you don't see them in fields and in the ditches like we used to. But it's because we've trained deer to be wary or afraid of vehicles that stop nearby. And so, let's, here we are, let's say it's morning and you're heading to your hunting area. Now, we camp or we hunt, so I hear this myself all the time. I'm already in my, in my stand on the woods when most of the hunters who come from somewhere else to hunt in the region are just starting to move in. And most of them are planning not to hunt or to begin hunting until it's light enough to see where they're going. And uh, that makes sense, of course. So even though they're missing out the best of buck hunting. But anyway, they, they, uh, they plan it for that. So we're sitting here and you hear these trucks and vehicles roaring along the road and the gravel roads all washed away and roaring. You can hear them miles away and you hear them going by and then you hear them turn up, up that road a little while and then you hear them going over that way and all of a sudden they stop. No sound. Now if you're a deer in the woods, here's a vehicle that came toward you and stopped. And if you're a buck three and a half years of age or older, you know darn well what that means. Pretty soon there's going to be a hunter coming toward you. You know, that's what happened. That's a prime to hunting, that sound of that vehicle coming and stopping. Or it might be a different kind of a vehicle. It might be an ATV or an OHV or a snowmobile uh, that comes from some other place, uh, maybe off a trailer off, uh, you know, on the main road, and then here, here it comes down the road, and it's roaring down the road, and it comes to a spot, and you're standing on the hill, and this trail's going up the hill, and it stops right down there where the trail begins. It stops, and it's dark. And then you hear voices, and you hear clickety-clicking, guns being loaded, then you hear the car door slam, or tailgate slam or trunk slam, real loud, kaboom, kaboom. You can hear that on a quiet morning. You can hear a car door being slammed a mile away. And you hear all that. And there's now an older buck that doesn't realize hunting is beginning right now. We can expect a hunter or several hunters to appear, be coming up in their direction real soon. So most bucks decide I guess I want to be over there on that side of the square mile, on my square mile. I don't want to be here this morning, that's for sure. And Or if they wait, or other deer, they might wait and hide in cover because they, they've learned if they do that, get off that trail on one side and stand in cover, they can watch and pretty soon here they come and there's flashlights. Or there's no flashlights, it's getting light now. They're coming up there, and they're stopping and looking around. And boy, they're sure acting like they're hunting all right. All those kind of things. And they, as long as those people stay on that trail and go by, they're not going to worry about them, even if they are hunting, because they're secure in the thought that they don't know I'm here. They, they just keep going by. So after a while, after they're out of hearing, they start 
doing what they were doing in the first place, like feeding or going to a feeding area or going back to a bedding area or whatever. So anyway, keeping from alarming a buck, that's why it starts way back. In our area, it starts the minute we step out of our tents and where you are, it starts when you get close to your hunting area. You don't even have to be there yet because you're making the sounds that tell the buck that you'd like to take. Here I come. Now, you got to stop doing that. You know, where we hunt, we do not uh, use an ATV or HV or anything like that, a truck or a car, to get close to a trail that we plan to use to go to a stand site. Nowadays, even if we have to walk a couple miles in the morning, you know, we has got a two-mile hike ahead of us. We get started by 5 o'clock at least. Uh, we aren't going to drive to that trail because when you do that, any buck near that trail when it's going up the hill, the buck, very buck you want to get might be there if there's snow on the ground. You might not know it until you get up there a block or two. Holy cow, there's that big buck that's right here and use that feeding area where they has got to be in the field. You might decide at that point, I'm not going to where I was going to go in this point. I'm going to get over on this side of the feeding area, kind of on this corner, so I'm kind of downwind or crosswind of it. And that's where I'm going to sit this morning. That's what you might decide. You know, at least half the bucks us Nordbergs take are taken when we've made a decision like that while on the way to a stand sign. Change your mind because this is where that big buck is right now. Right now. Because here's this frustra. It was with a doe, which means she's probably in heat. And they're over there in that feeding area right now because they started feeding her, you know, four or five this morning. And they're still out there and it's still dark. And, and I've got, I know that area over there, I know a good spot where I'm going to sit. Uh, if I don't have a tree stand there, I'm going to go sit there on the ground where I've got good cover, well covered, and a natural cam, uh, concealment there, and boy, it's a good spot to sit. And so sort of growing up with brush a little bit out there, but I don't have to see that whole field to take a buck. All I need is a little crack six inches wide, open to that buck when here he comes, there he's walking through there, he's behind the door, and you see it, and it kind of hold on the opening ahead of him, and that's where you get him. That's the way to hunt big bucks. But that's why it's so important to begin early, <laughs> to keep from alarming any deer in your hunting hunt. Because to take that big buck, all those other deer, all those not, 14 and 19 other deer in that square mile, uh, you have to keep from alarming any of them to keep your chances good of taking that biggest buck in that square mile. So that's important. That's why you've got to avoid making sounds that tell deer you're, you're, a, you're a human and, and you're hunting, which makes you dangerous. You've got to avoid those things. Honestly, you don't want to go through more hunting seasons doing what you've been doing for years and years and years, or even if you're just getting started and wondering what to do. You need some kind of a source of information that gives you the straight dope on what you need to know and what you need to do to be successful at taking older bucks. And I don't know, I don't think there's a book anywhere in the world that does that better and provides you with that kind of information better than this book because of the, all the research and time, many years. You know, this represents uh, studies of wild whitetails going back to 1960. Long time. So, what? So, that's the book you want to be a buck hunter the rest of your life. One that can be really successful. You know, you might not, there might be years when you don't get one or many years you say, oh, I'm not going to shoot that one. He's a three and a half year old. There's bigger ones out here. And you do that in the end of the season, you might think, oh, I should have taken that buck. There, there can be years you won't get one. And uh, where I am now with the deer population down to three per square mile, it might be several years like that. But normally, you know, with normal deer population of 15 or more per square mile, you should be able to get one almost every year. Certainly 10 or maybe 11 years out of 12, 
if you're doing what this book tells you to do. How about that? <laughs> so don't miss a chance to learn what's in this book and a chance to have a place to, to go back to, to to remind you what you have to do to successfully take big parts. So with that, I'm going to say goodbye again, guys. And uh, before you check off, guys, be sure to hit that subscribe button. It'll only take about two minutes of your time, maybe less. It doesn't cost anything. But it helps me. It, it's a favor to me. And, and that thumbs up button, if you truly appreciate what you've learned today, give me that thumbs up button as well. I appreciate that. that those are important things to being on YouTube. And uh, so I want to keep keep this up as long as I can. So do that for me, will you? And uh, uh, you'll find everything you want to find to order this book on my website, dr. Nor dr. Nordberg on drnordberg.com. And go to that, go to the store or whatever, and you'll find the order forms and everything you need. And nowadays you can't even buy a box of bullets for that. So <laughs> that's pretty cheap for... The, what it does for you, for you know, for the, the improvement you're going to experience as a buck hunter. So that's that's a bargain. <laughs> so thanks, guys, and I'll see you again soon. Be sure to visit my website. Here's the link. Here you'll find links to my blog posts, my Twitter account, my YouTube account, my Amazon store with links to my eBooks. My son's eBay store, a money saver if you're ordering from Canada or other countries. My website bookstore and much more.